Good morning, good morning, good morning. <clears throat> How are you? It's a sort of a damp morning, but uh, still not too cold. I finally got my central heating fixed after three years. Angry, how did you manage without central heating for three years, I hear you ask. I don't hear you ask. Okay, well I'm going to tell you anyway. We had, uh, basically our tank was condemned. We had an old metal tank. And it was propped up on uh, sawn off telegraph poles and eventually they just stopped delivering oil to it. And so we had to save up to get a new tank. And it's a PIA because, you know, the tank costs 3,000 pounds and if they just carried on filling up the old one it would have been all right probably but anyway and then when you've got it filled up it's empty and you have to um then you have to save up to put some fuel in it so anyway it's an auspicious day today it's the 9th of november 2018 and uh of course you immediately know what that date is, don't you? No, you don't. The 9th of November 2018 is the day that the GDPA would have turned 65 if it had continued in its, its you know, in its incarnation as a representative body for general dental practitioners. So, it uh, nobody's too sure because uh, the records of that time are sort of buried quite deep you know quite lost and uh, their uh, actual date that it was formed is uh, I'm reasonably sure is accurate it, and it was arrived at by talking to not the original members uh, the, the Maliks and the uh, and the original Watsons but uh, um, it was, you know, the second, what I call the second generation, the Paddy Doherty's, the Tony Clifton Samuels and all that. So, it's a sort of a, it's a, it's a sad day in a way because I think I'm probably the only person now who would have a date like that in their calendar, you know. It's not something that anyone really, so we're, it's in the process of fading out from the collective uh, consciousness. Um, and it's a shame because um, I'll tell you a little story. I had a friend of mine uh, I met through, a, we were both members of Mensa, so we met through the, the local Mensa group. And uh, he's a guy called John. He's, uh, he's a funny guy, uh, been in the army, a bit of a jack of all trades, you know. Uh, did a lot of plumbing he was came out of the army went in and became a fitter and fitted uh, boilers and it was while he was working at that job that he inhaled the asbestos that uh, later killed him uh, but that's not the point the point was that uh, he uh, was a was a fantastic gardener and had an encyclopedic knowledge about plants and he's one of these guys that, uh, and we, we bought a cottage, uh, sort of 15, 20 years ago, and the people before us had been farmers, or uh, apple, you know, grew apple trees, and um, this had been their sort of farm cottage, and their fathers before them, and fathers, fathers, etc, etc. So it had a fantastic garden, I mean there was a fantastic collection of plants in this garden to the extent that um, it was open to the public it was one of these gardens that in the spring when they do um, garden opening uh, it was a, it was of a sufficient standard that they uh, uh, you know used to show it to the public and when they moved out they took a, a ton of the plants with them they, they weren't supposed to but they did because um, and in hindsight, it was a bit mean, really. I always think it's very mean and fraudulent to sell a sell a house and then try and asset strip it before the new people move in. But I suppose it saved the plants because we didn't really we didn't have the enthusiasm for gardening that they did, and so they probably would have died anyway. But I mean, they were our plants. I mean, we did reserve the right to kill them, 
Um, but um, anyway, John was the sort of person he would walk around. He walked around our garden. He said, "This is this plant." But he got the Latin name and everything. And uh, and when he died, all that knowledge was lost. And it struck me as being exceedingly wasteful. You know, I mean, bearing in mind that as a species we we're trying to strive aren't we always upwards upwards onwards ever upwards and it seems to me incredibly wasteful that when people die all the everything they know is just gone um and i can't i mean you know i'm, I'm a great believer in things having an evolutionary advantage i do believe that uh, you know things are the way they are because they're best in that way and uh, you have to work out why they're best in that way even if they look to you as though they're not that's not the best way of doing it so you you could argue that um, that this loss is is of a benefit so so why why might it be of a benefit and the answer to that probably lies in the fact that you know we'd still be doing things in the way uh, we, with the ways of the 1700s the 1800s are still some of that would still be around if the generation that did that um, was still a, you know were had passed on the knowledge either were still around because they didn't die or they would in some way managed to pass down the knowledge that uh, you know that that's just the way things were done and everybody was sort of constrained to carry on doing things that way so there's a sort of a change, isn't there? There's a opportunity for development. There's a uh, there's a scope for old ideas to, to die out if they're not supported by the new generation. And the new generation is helped by the fact that they don't know how things were done. They have to reinvent the wheel. And uh, they, they're forced to reinvent the wheel. Um, and uh, it has to be you know sometimes the wheels not even as good as the previous wheel now there is uh, of course it struck me this morning a way that knowledge is passed on from generation to generation even when it can't be done through word of mouth you know we lose the expertise of, of people like John and and obviously it's in written material recorded material um, you know what the younger generation will call data now and that all that stuff is previous generations speaking to us except that we don't the vast majority of the patient just uh, of the population doesn't uh, is, it doesn't understand or is not inclined to find out or, or is prevented from having access to this material and if you take Bitcoin for example Bitcoin is will will eventually be the the currency franco you know it'll be what everyone will use but um it's run into considerable headwind and opposition from the establishment and there's only one way to get around that and the establishment has to die out you know they have to they have to grow old they have to retire and they have to hand over the financial reins to people who are born on or around on or after 1985 you know the millennials is, you know, crypto is the currency of the millennials and, and it will get adopted when they come when their grandparents die their parents die and they come into whatever money there is in the world but going back to my theme of uh, you know the GDPA and speaking to people from the past um, as editor of the uh, GDPA magazine fusion magazine uh, it did, you know, sometimes we used to look through old issues for inspiration and and the one thing that I always found and, and the reason why I stopped going through them was that um, whatever you were writing about, you, you found that someone was writing about it 10 years earlier, the same subject, you know, <clears throat> nothing had ever happened, nothing had improved, the problem was still the same problem, people were different people were complaining about it but it was complaining about the same thing and then if you went back 20 years you'll find that the people 10 years ago 
if they'd gone back 10 years, would have found that people were still complaining about the same thing. And the problems are, the problems that we face are not um, difficult to identify, really. They are not, you know, providing you're prepared to keep an open mind and sort of do some sort of reasonably unbiased scientific analysis or thinking or, or rational thinking um, you can easily see what the problems are the reason why they don't get solved is not because they're not known it's because uh, there's there are too you know too many people are invested in the status quo some people can't see the problems uh, they're basically not not bright enough you know they're not they don't have the the mental capacity and this, this I think was the case with um, the Chief Dental Officer Cockroft. I just don't think he was intelligent enough to see how the service could be improved and chose a route which was doomed to failure and is, and is now failing, you know, has now failed. Um, but I, th I think the reason why these problems are never solved is because almost always the power is uh, concentrated in the hands of one person whether it's the Secretary of State, Minister of State, Chief Dental Officer, uh, you know Permanent Secretary, the, the Department of Health, you name it, the head of the head of the Commons Select Committee on Health etc and these people are not um, they're very much like weather forecasters who would come along and say well uh, the weather today is going to be pretty much like it was yesterday so if you thought that you might need to take an umbrella yesterday then more or less you might like to think about whether you need to take an umbrella today you know and 80 percent of the time that would be correct you know that would that that works that approach most of the time which is, i think is why it's adopted but um, back to the sort of the real topic, which is the 65th anniversary of the of the GDPA. Um, you know, it's it's interesting. I've got you know I'm nearly at work now. I've got about five, six, eight minutes or something to sort of try and put down what I think about the GDPA. I wasn't involved in the early days, in in the very early years. Um, uh, I tried to. Uh, be some, something of a bridge between the GDPR, I was on the GDPA Council and, and the BDA's uh, GDSC, which was the General Dental Services Committee, which was their uh, internal subcommittee that represented general practitioners, so I had a foot in both camps and was roundly roasted by Brian Lux of the GDPA for trying to do that. Um, it occurred to me that uh, there was no will or, you know, on, on the BDA side to to work together and um, and that was not because you know that was because they were actively I mean a lot, some of them were actively hostile to the GDPA but it was basically you know it was like the Americanism American exceptionalism type approach where they had a BDA exceptionalism where they were like well we, we don't need we don't need you you know we don't need anyone there is only us so you thanks for your offer but you know we just can't be asked and that in the end was you know the problem um, and you know not without some justification they had the eyes and ears of government alone and government were complicit in that and the BDA delivered a lot of things to the government in return for that that uh, disadvantaged both the profession and the patients but not enough for the dentist to lose confidence in the BDA and not enough for the patients to lose confidence in the government so it was a relationship that worked uh, very well for them to the exclusion of of the profession and the patients and obviously the GDPA. So, uh, like I say, it's a uh, it's a sad day for me personally because I, I, you know, large thousands and thousands and thousands of hours of my life were devoted towards improving the terms and conditions of dentists working in general practice um, a group which 
had no public sympathy, you know. No, everybody thought that uh, the, the dental service could be sorted out if only the dentist would take a pay cut. That's the only thing they thought. And, you know, we fought very hard to try and get them to understand that uh, dentists needed to be paid according to the skill set that was required, which was like a mental skill set, an academic skill set, you know, a financial skill set and a manual skill set. And very few jobs have that, which is why dentists are, are highly paid. And also that the money that goes towards paying the dental workforce really should be separate from the money that goes towards providing the, the service, you know, the treatment. And that you can't say, well, um, you know, in order to provide more treatment, we'll just pay the workforce less. <clears throat> it really doesn't work like that. You have to treat the two sums some, uh, separately. And it worked the other way because whenever we campaigned for more uh, higher fees, they always said, well, that will mean less, fewer fillings. And we were like, why? <laughs> Why are you treating the workforce budget and the service provision budget in the same, in you know, as, as one and the same thing? And I suppose it, in a way to them it was the same thing, you know. It was all just dentistry. <coughs> and it was never on the first page of any agenda. Uh, well, I suppose it was in 92 when, during the strike and everything, but after that not much. So, what I think, because I think, uh, now I'm not going to write a memoir, so don't worry, you know, I'm not going to come out with, a, like Margaret Seawood with a book, My Life, you know, how interesting was that? <laughs> Answer, not much. <laughs> so, everybody thinks their life is fascinating, and then writes a book and gets itself published, and then is, is reduced to giving it away to people they've only ever met once. Uh, but, um, I do think the archives of the GDPA deserve immortalising, if only in a sort of a very rough, raw form, uh, a raw digital form, so that someone in the future can uh, have a look and, and make some sense of this, <clears throat> this sort of group of general practitioners that grew out of the formation of the National Health Service in 1948 to become at, at, at some points and probably the last high point I think was 92 when I was running it and meeting with Brian Mawinney and uh, uh, and that idiot Reed of the uh, what's his first name Reed of the Labour Party um, you know were were quite influential in the days before dentists all decided that all they didn't want an association or a movement or subscriptions or you know officers executive officers so they, they just wanted a Facebook group and just to give everything thumbs up and thumbs down and uh, I suppose I'm a bit of a dinosaur as well I mean I should be retiring soon I'm 60 next year so uh, although I don't think I will you know unless things certain investments turn out rather well for me um, but my generation, I mean, soon we're talking about the millennials and soon, you know, there won't be many dentists working who were born before 1985. There'll be the millennial generation of dentists. They'll never have known a fee for item system. They won't know, they won't know the, <laughs> the quality of the dentistry in the 1980s when I qualified on the National Health Service uh, exceeds the quality in most private practices now, you know. They won't know a time when you could uh, fall out of your front door and hit your head on a National Health Service dentist where, almost wherever you were in the country. They won't understand it, they won't believe it, you know. And the old way of doing things, I, I'm determined that the old way of doing things, which I firmly believe was a better way, the self-employed subcontractor and not the sort of the micromanaged service that we've got at the moment where uh, you know the collectivist approach the, the um, socialized medicine the uh, approach which produces all the appalling stories that I have so much fun telling you about every morning um, I don't believe that that is the best approach I think 
I, I'm sad to say that we went in my lifetime from from a, an excellent system to a rubbish system. <laughs> we really did. We really did. I mean, I and I wanted so hard to be able to say at the end of my career that you know I'd improved things and. And, and I always knew that there would be as many people with decay when I retired as there 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 were when I qualified. I mean, I didn't expect to, um, you know, solve the problem of stupidity and decay. But I honestly thought that we'd be better set up to deal with it. You know, we'd have a better system, and not not arguably a much much worse system. <laughs> Literally, whew, my, during my career, whew, as far as the, the provision has gone. And it's and it's a shame and all i can say is i did my best you know i really 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 did my best honestly i did my best i devoted as much time as much energy and as much money as i could to 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 uh trying to improve the system and and possibly i slowed its decline a bit but uh force is greater than i unfortunately were in charge and uh, they ensured that <laughs> the whole thing <laughs> turned to shit <laughs> So that's my perspective on my career since 1979 in the GDPA, and uh, and many happy returns GDPA 65 today. I shall be having a I shall be having a drink tonight to celebrate your 65th birthday. Okay, many many happy returns and uh, a long and happy retirement. Talk to you tomorrow. Bye.